Yeah. So my name is Rupert Kagel. I'm from Graz University of Technology, that's in Austria. Uh, I'm a system professor at that place and I'm here to actually present and represent our working group. So uh, what's happened in your working group? So the working group is actually a biomaterial science group and at the same time a group that works on the organic chemistry of monosaccharides, so sugars. So that sounds a bit separate, but we try to combine actually uh, the monosaccharide chemistry to chemically modify biomaterials. And these materials are actually used um, in the biomedical field as they are named biomaterials. So we try to make materials and design materials that interact with living cells and tissue. And one part of the whole work is about designing implants actually. So making kind of implants, but also about mimicking, say, the biomechanical properties of vessels and tissue. So tissue engineering in the broadest sense. And uh, does it work? Uh, preliminary, I would say yes, it does. So when we're talking especially about these tissue models, uh, we can construct them, especially with 3D printing. That's why we're here also at the conference to present our 3D, 3D printing approach. So uh, preliminary tests have shown that we can make models uh, that have similar biomechanics as natural tissue or natural vessels. Uh, but we are not at the stage yet, I would say, to make very large models in 3D printed uh, techniques uh, or we are not at the stage to implant it. So it takes time, I would say, still to, uh, to develop the technology further. And uh, you talk about sugar? I was talking about sugar as well, so that's actually the second part of our working group in our institute. Uh, the sugar, of course, is a very important nutrient uh, molecule or nutrient molecules. Uh, but it's also at the same time part of polymers that are natural materials. So if you think about paper, uh, of course, so plant fibers, they are, you know, the molecule cellulose, it's composed or comprised of sugars. Uh, the same sugar actually that, that we uh, eat almost uh, every day, so glucose. So by understanding the chemistry of the sugar monomers, so small building blocks of the polymers, uh, and combining it with polymeric materials, we, we hope to say design new materials uh, as I said for biomedical applications but there is also the very big topic actually of pollution environmental pollution and polymers and as you know cellulose is a natural bio, uh, biopolymer so it can also degrade in the environment so plastic pollution for instance can be targeted by substituting synthetic plastics with cellulose uh, so sugar polymers so very how broad can sugar, how can sugar help with pollution uh, as I said, so we have, when we talk about sugar, we talk about renewable materials. So, so usually these are agricultural polymers. So sugar is of course grown, sugar beet or sugar cane, but other agricultural materials are cellulose, as I said. So trees <laughs> in a simple, uh, simple case. <clears throat> and from trees you can extract, but also from other plants you can extract fibers. And, and these fibers, as we all know, uh, can be manufactured into paper which is an important packaging material, of course. And paper is, I would say, in so far less pollutive because it's quite degradable. So if you look into pollution in, in the sea, uh, plastics that you find swimming in the sea, unfortunately, uh, is usually something like which is relatively undegradable, but paper itself would degrade quite quickly in seawater. But from these sugar polymers that I mentioned, you can also make textiles. So there is, of course, technology uh, to transfer paper fibers or paper material like materials into textile fibers and then you get something that is somehow I would say related to cotton so similar to cotton and this is also quite easily degradable at least in the open water environment of the sea so. Is uh, sugar one of those like benzene like uh, a petrol that, that runs the body and the body really wants it crazed with and uh, is there anything to think about that and what you're doing? Yeah, sure. I mean, as I said, nutrition, sugar and nutrition, so our brain mostly runs on glucose, so, or, or only on glucose, so the brain cells, they are really fired, I would say, uh, by, by burning glucose. So. so, of course, it's an integral uh, part of, the, of our metabolism. Uh, so it has a lot to do, of course, with food, yeah? so it's, it's no question about this. Uh, so it has also a lot to do with health, but I mean, the, the topics are so broad that it's quite hard to maybe to explain today everything about it. Uh, but yeah, sure, sugar is an important, uh, say, 
factor in the whole story, I'd say. What does it mean that the working group is like uh, across universities, across uh, industry, and, and who's, uh, what, what does it mean? I mean, the working scientists, we, uh, we as scientists, or we in particular, we would define working group as a team of, say, 15 to 20 uh, members. So that starts with lab technicians, but also with students. So the students are involved in an early stage and then goes on to PhD students, uh, assistant professors, postdoctoral researchers and professors. So it's a team of, say about, in our case, about 20 people, which is an organizational unit at the university. So the working group is in this case, a small unit uh, performing research and is of course also doing exchange on the one hand to students in terms of education, but on the other hand also like we do it here, uh, communicating uh, science uh, with, with uh, specialists, but sometimes also with the public as, as uh, it is done now. There's uh, many students here and maybe some have, uh, they want to work in this, this area, and maybe they're in another university and they just collaborate, or how does it work? Yeah, uh, it depends, I think, at which level the students work. So if they're, for instance, bachelor students and they finish after three years, they're, they're great. Uh, I'd say they are maybe not that mobile, even though they are also programs. So if you think about the Erasmus uh, program, which is a very successful European uh, Union-funded program to to uh, exchange students in the European within uh, universities at the European Union. Uh, but then I think, uh, say, the more educated people become, uh, the more possibilities are there to exchange. So of course uh, you have postdoctoral stays. Some uh, some programs also funded by the European Union, by the way. Uh, allow joint doctorates between universities so that you would be enrolled at two places, two countries and doing your degree at both uh, universities. So there is a lot, I think, going on. Uh, people might not be, I would say the general public might maybe not be always aware how many things are happening behind the curtains or in, in different communities. So uh, science communication is very important and, and that's also why we're here, I'd say, to, to tell what we're doing. How far advanced and uh, realized is the nanobiomedicine field uh, do you think and do you think it's possible to achieve results very soon in some of these things you're talking about? Mm. Um, I would say in terms of science so what's really happening what people research and what people publish uh, it's very fancy so it's very advanced there are things happening that that we would not think about maybe a decade or two decades ago. Uh, what It's a different thing, what's really then transferred into an application, of course, because the regulatory issues are very strict, which is, of course, a good thing, especially in health, that uh, you can, of course, not, not try everything immediately. So I, th I think, but this also, of course, hampers or, or somehow delays, maybe, innovation. And uh, maybe the other question is also ethics, of course. So, because now, and we heard a lot of things about gene technology, which is in some parts of, of the population maybe not so popular. Uh, now the technology is so far that it can also be, technology can always be either dangerous or beneficial, but it's, it's quite uh, tough actually what could be done with, for instance, gene technology, but then there is ethics, of course. So, I mean, I mean the general public has to decide if, uh, if they want, uh, and everybody actually has to contribute to that, if they want to have a certain technology uh, used uh, and, and put into practice. Sometimes the, the benefit outweigh the risk and you just have to go ahead full speed and try to find solutions for some of yeah. the problems in society. Yeah. And maybe you have them. I think there is no one-size-fits-all solution. So if someone says I have the solution to everything I think or to a real uh, uh, pressing problem, I think this is maybe too overrated. Uh, so it's always a compromise, I think. Uh, but yeah, definitely. I mean, the most pressing problem uh, we know all is, I would say, climate change now, and related to that also migration, population growth, and all the all the things that uh, overconsumption that that are happening. Uh, but of course, we are in a we are in democracy, so, so finding the or making the right decisions is not never a decision of one person. So it's a compromise between many people. Uh, there are solutions technologically, I would say. To climate change, it's, it's a bit off topic, but uh, it, it could be done, but it really requires, uh, I would say, the, the uh, cooperation of many different stakeholders, the very often used words, uh, that, that uh, would improve the situation. 
there, there was a question, but I'm not sure if it's uh, relevant to what you were saying. Uh, with the continued use of single-use plastics, how does the pricing compare currently? I don't know if you were talking about anything to do with that. I don't think so. Uh, about pricing of plastics? Or? I yeah, he was talking about single-use plastics. Mm -hmm. It's just okay. in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think single-use plastics, I mean, I think it has a lot to do with behavior, no? So if you, if you just throw away your cigarette butts after you smoked it and you throw it on the floor, it's actually not necessary, no? So it, there would be a very simple solution to it, so you just change the behavior and you collect it. And very similar, I think it is for the use of plastic, especially single-use plastic. I think it's just not necessary for our lifestyle or for our quality of life to throw things away if we use it once. So neither from a hygiene perspective nor from a, from a health perspective. And also, I think, not from an economic perspective. Uh, so, of course, taxation and rules might improve this very much. Uh, so did, you have, yeah. did you have a good uh, nanotechnology conference? 